So, who here has used WordPress? Uh, okay, I love it. Who's used WordPress.com specifically? Okay, so um, hands up who knows the difference between the two. Most. Okay, cool. So, I don't have to explain too much. So, WordPress itself is uh, under a non profit organization, it's an open source project, mostly volunteer contributors. Um, and the guys who started WordPress also started a company which is uh, automatic uh, to in a way support the project and uh, that's who I work for and we build WordPress.com which is like a hosted freemium SaaS version of WordPress. Now, a few years ago, um, which is a very long time ago in the world of tech, um, WordPress.com looked a bit like this. So. If you've used WordPress at all, you would recognize this. It's the screen that you would use to make a new post. Uh, so people who use WordPress all the time are fairly familiar with this screen. Um, but there's a lot going on, as you can see. There's, so for, for people starting out, it can be a bit daunting. Uh, and this was all entirely built on PHP, so we're running WordPress itself uh, locally, and we modify it. Um, for the paid plans and all of these things. So a few years ago we thought, how can we change it? How can we improve it for the users? So especially people getting started for the first time. So we went through a bit of process and it's been going on for quite a while. We rebuilt parts of it, we redesigned, so this is one of the early designs. It was still PHP and a lot of jQuery thrown in, which um, probably a lot of you are familiar with. Um, and then we thought, screw it, let's just start again from scratch. If, if we were rebuilding WordPress again today, what would we build it in? And that's how Calypso was born. So this is our code name for the new WordPress.com. And this is what it looks like today. It's a much cleaner and simpler uh, interface to use, and we found it's been hugely successful in terms of People, helping people start blogging and posting more often and coming back. And it's entirely written in JavaScript. So what we've done is uh, rebuild the entire front end. Most of the back end is still the same. And we have connected up to the API. So everything you see at WordPress.com now is entirely a single page JavaScript app. And we also bundled it into an Electron app so you can download it and run it um, locally without needing the internet. So why would you rewrite the entire thing? There's a bit of a risk, right? So it's hard to make a case for, well, we're going to throw out everything that we've done, that we've worked for so many years on, and start from scratch. Um, look, in hindsight, it was a great idea, but at the time, it was a pretty risky move. Um, our CEO said at the time, um, has said recently that you know, one of the hardest things to do in technology is to disrupt yourself because it's so easy to get set in your ways and you know, to keep continuing on the way that you're going. A few reasons. Speed was a huge one. Uh, with the PHP app and maybe Rails app as well, you've always got that issue of every time you make an action, you just change a page, you've got to go back to the server, download everything again. So with a single page JavaScript app, you've got that instant response. You click on something, changes page. Um, you still need to load the data, but at least you get that difference in uh, feeling which keeps people engaged with the application. Mobile first. This is something, so WordPress was created over 10 years ago and in a time when mobile wasn't really a thing. And so we wanted to design, again, starting from scratch, thinking about mobile first and upgrading to desktops. Uh, WordPress was also designed sort of for a single site, so you download it, you install it on your server, and uh, that's it, good to go for your site. But we have people with a lot of sites on WordPress.com, they might have several different, maybe one about cooking, one about animals, um, some people have several businesses. So we want to make it easy for them to manage all of their different sites easily. Um, we also wanted to make it so that it was easy to connect with other bloggers, so in the same sense that uh, Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr and these guys um, make it make you more connected in the sense that um, you can see what everyone else is doing, you can engage with other other people. We also we wanted to re rethink of WordPress in that sense, we, and also to make it offline so that 
you know, when you come to CampJS, you can actually still write blogs. Um, and it was also a really good chance for us to completely reinvent our process. So because we started quite a while ago, it was use, we were using SVN. Um, we, were using, uh, we didn't have any formal code review process, so it was just sort of, you could put out a code review if you wanted, but a lot of times it was just commit or see if something breaks. So this was a good chance to look at new things like GitHub and the pull request method, so that's what we use now. So how do we do it? First step is learn JavaScript. Um, a few years ago, most of the company were PHP developers. We didn't. We sort of used jQuery, and it was a, a bit of a paradigm shift to, to suddenly switch to to an entirely JS app. Um, but it worked. It, a lot of people started. So once we got people on board with it internally, it sort of built up and built up, and we got really inspired to actually learn JavaScript. Um, we learned from other projects. So we took, uh, at the time we'd actually acquired Cloud, uh, which is a file, uh, image sharing, video sharing software, and they had a uh, single page app, so they gave us a few pointers. Um, now there's a multitude of open source apps out there to learn from. Uh, our REST API was kind of a little bit immature at the time, so this was also a chance to kind of make our API more mature by relying entirely on the API. So this meant that any data we had to populate the, the uh, application we had to come from the REST API um, to connect to the old system. And legacy links. So we still keep that old system, the WordPress admin system there, um, and we've had to redirect people to that for things that aren't implemented in the new software. And it's been running for, uh, it's actually been over a year that it's been live. Um, and we've just slowly added features to the new one and sort of pointed them back to the old one. Text app. We're not using any frameworks, kind of. So that was the plan uh, a few years ago. We wanted to, to go you know, vanilla, start from nothing, and build everything. But we ended up settling on this stack. So React and Redux, um, and then Babel and Webpack is what we're using now. This didn't happen at the beginning though, this was a process, so we actually started with nothing and we pretty quickly implemented React because that was a huge, huge, huge uh, productivity boost for us. So React gave us some really cool things, like reusable components. So we had a couple of levels of these, um, reusable components in the sense of simple reusable things that you could use across any application, um, buttons, you know, accordions, these kind of things. And then we go a step further and it's very custom sort of components that are reusable inside the app. So this is a little uh, indicator for how much space you've used on your plan. This is pretty specific to us, but it's an easily reusable component we can just plug anywhere. And these can be built up of the, the simpler components. So this is something actually that I uh, only really learned the difference to last week. Um, declarative and imperative has been uh, a big shift. So the difference between declarative and imperative is basically when you say declarative, you're thinking of things like HTML and CSS, where you describe how the things should be. Whereas imperative, you're describing how things change. So if you think about HTML, you're always kind of describing uh, how things should look or how they should be. You're not describing anything that changes. Whereas when you add something, add some sort of you know, traditional programming language, um, JavaScript, it's imperative. You're describing step by step the process that things change. So I'll give you a quick example of this. Say you have this save button, and when you click on it, you want to change the text to saving. Now, how would you do this in pure PHP? Maybe something like this. You have a form, and as soon as you click the button that submits the form, it has to go back to the server. The server generates something, again, that says save it. And it's a pretty slow process, so no one would probably actually do this. Um, but you can see here it's described in the way that you're saying it looks either like saving or it looks like save, depending on the state of the, the button. You're not saying how anything's changing here, you're just saying this is how it looks, depending on the state. If you bring in jQuery, 
you start with just a button that says save, and you add some code that might, when you click on it, uh, change the button to save it. So in, in this case, you're actually describing, you're saying, when this happens, take this action. And this was great. This is how jQuery took over everything, because you could do it all on the browser side. You could describe everything on the server, and then in the browser, you could describe how things change in response to actions. The problem with this is that there can be an any number of these changes, and it's really difficult to trace back which of those affect which things. So in a simple application like this, it's, it's fine, but when you have an application, I'm sure if you've worked with jQuery, you've seen it, it grows and grows and grows, and you have people adding things to different parts, and not, it's, it's not obvious how they interact. So you have this infinite number of states that your application can be in, and you can't trace them. So the cool thing about React is that it brings you back to that declarative style that we're familiar with, in that you can now describe this is how something looks depending on the state. There is still some imperative code in there when you're saying change the state of the data. So in this case, we're just changing a boolean to true for saving. Um, but we're still, in terms of the way that things look, it's still completely declarative. You can describe every single possible way that your application will look uh, declaratively. Redux was also a huge uh, thing for us. So React kind of took care of the view side of things, but the data, control, take, taking care of the data was actually a little bit more complicated. And we originally adopted Flux, um, the Facebook's, um, it's not so much a framework, but a philosophy about uh, how to arrange data. And Redux came along last, last year, uh, I think it was last year, and it's, it's kind of the, the go-to implementation for it. The great thing about Redux is that you can define all of your actions um, in one place. So we have a single file that has a list of every single action that you can take. And this means that if you want to know any, any kind of action that goes on in the application, you can open this one file and you can see every single thing, whether it's a user action or the applications, maybe fetching some data. Anything that would change the application is all listed in this one file. Um, and then through that you can go dig down through the folders and find how it's uh, actually implemented. Uh, a global state tree has been a big thing, so this is part of Redux. Um, all of your data is in this one sort of giant object, and it sounds like a bad thing, but it's actually a, um, the way that you can compose things makes it so it's still modular in a sense, but you have this global um, view of everything. So on the left here you can see there's a, uh, this is our folder structure, this is how we lay out the project, and we map that to the actual object itself. So if you want to find out how some nested object somewhere in that state uh, is coded, you can just go through the folder structure and find that exact uh, uh, logic. So there's a few challenges with this project. Um, probably the, one of the earlier uh, challenges was browser support. Um, we support IE6. Uh, I'm just kidding. We, there's no way we support IE6. Uh, we decided to just support the last two browser, major browser versions. Um, and this does mean some people are kind of locked out, uh, but we, just, we can redirect them to the old system, luckily, because we have this legacy system. Um, and also, it kind of encourages people to upgrade. But for those people who want to use it and for whatever reason are still using IE6, that's what the desktop, desktop app is for. Right? You can just provide this download and they can start using it straight away. Uh, bundle size is a big problem in JavaScript apps. We're currently at over a megabyte. Um, we haven't really worked out a way to solve this yet. Um, but again, the desktop app is kind of a solution to that. Um, because if you're on a sort of bad connection, you can download the desktop app. Everything is already there in the, the package, so you won't have to re-download it every time you open it up. Um, error handling has been tricky because with PHP, we get immediate feedback on errors on our end. If, if somebody does something that triggers an error on the server side, we can log back, we can go back through and we can see um, what's causing it. Whereas on the client side, it happens in the browser, so we can't really see that. 
Um, so one option for that is telemetry, which is something we're exper uh, experimenting with. Changing tech. This is one of the toughest things in JavaScript. So it changes so fast, and in the three years since we started the project, we've switched things around quite a few times. Um, so one of these examples is upgrading to Babel. Um, so only a few years ago, we just learned JavaScript, and now suddenly everyone's learning a new JavaScript. But it turns out that this is actually a, a huge productivity boost because it's still the same language, it's just that you get these kind of um, small improvements on it. So this is an example of, um, on the top you see a, a standard JavaScript function and then you can see it's much more succinct and readable. So we've sort of, we still have parts of our code base that are running the old one, uh, the old uh, ES uh, style, and then we have kind of as we touch things, we improve them and upgrade them. And you can do the same thing with React you now, you can use these um, arrow functions to shorten that entire component. Um, as I mentioned, we start off with Flux and migrated to Redux. Um, so we still have, we've got half of our code base is still in the Flux style, and then Redux, proper Redux style is uh, the other half. We're trying to sort of um, simultaneously add Redux things to running parts so we can just flick them over in batches. Um, and it's a little bit trickier to do live, but it's working for us so far. Um, this slide I actually just put in here just in case NPM goes down. Um, yeah, so left pad, if you don't know about what happened with this, it was a bit of a um, wake-up call, I think. Um, it broke WordPress.com. Uh, it didn't go down in a sense, but we couldn't develop um, when this happened. So there are a few ways to get around this. Um, mostly it involves running some kind of mirror that um, copies all of your NPM packages. So somebody actually unpublished this package called leftpad, which is the entire source code of it is right here on the screen. Um, and so many packages were depending on this, this one package that it broke a whole lot of NPM. And finally, it's open source. The entire front-end application is fully open source on GitHub, so you can check it out anytime. Um, and if you have any questions about it, um, well, you can't check it out here, obviously, but I can give you a tar file if you're interested in ch checking it out here and asking me any questions about it. Um, cool. Thank you very much. Sorry, I, I will say that we're probably running pretty tight for time, especially if you're hungry. Um, so maybe, this is Jordan. Jordan, you see, you see him. If you have questions, I would say bail him up and ask them to him. I'm sure there's some value in us all hearing the answer, but unfortunately, yeah, we're really tight for time. So I'd like to get Marcus up to do his talk on how we